Welcome everyone and thank you for listening in to Being With, a podcast series produced by the Biennale of Sydney as part of our 23rd edition, Rivers. Before we begin, I would like to take time to acknowledge the many different countries we connect from today. I come to you from Dudawara country. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of these lands, waters and skies, the Dudawara elders past, present and emerging. I extend this acknowledgement to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander friends here with us today. I would also like to take this opportunity to highlight the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's spirit, imagination and rich history of storytelling and artistic practice that is an ongoing inspiration to me personally and our team at the Biennale of Sydney. So my name is Leah Smith and I'm the Curator of Programs and Learning at the Biennale of Sydney and I'm delighted to be here today with Rivers participant Dr Alexandra Daisy Ginsberg. Daisy is an artist examining our fraught relationships with nature and technology. Through artworks, writing and curatorial projects, Ginsberg's work explores subjects as diverse as artificial intelligence, exobiology, synthetic biology, conservation, biodiversity and evolution, as she investigates the human impulse to better the world. Before we sink into conversation with Daisy, I will share a brief curatorial note on Being With. Being With features local and international voices from across our exhibition program. It aims to shed light on the rich and diverse relationships we hold with nature, science and technology through facilitating a deep dive into rich and ongoing creative and conceptual practices that span art, design, environmentalism, and activism. Through being with, we aim to demystify interspecies communication and connection through moving between micro and macro environments. Ancestral and futuristic knowledge systems and cultural practices will be discussed as tools for understanding how these relationships are and furthermore can be nurtured. Being with is a beautiful reminder that amidst a global pandemic, we are never truly alone. Today's talk with Daisy will be centered on being with AI. It will explore our human relationships with radically evolving and advanced technologies and our collective interest in moving towards a better world amidst a very different experience of that very same world. It's my great pleasure to now hand over to Daisy. Welcome Daisy and thanks for being with us. Uh, it's great to be with you. Thank you for having me. So would you mind um, please introducing yourself and sharing a little bit about where you connect to us from today? I'm Alexandra Daisy Ginsberg, or Daisy, and I'm an artist and my work looks at our relationship with, with nature and I often use technology to explore that. And I'm calling in from London where the sun is shining, surprisingly, and um, yeah, we're sort of life returning a little bit to normal here. Beautiful, yeah. It's um, it's kind of nice to feel a sense of recalibration. I think in the in the universe at the moment. Yeah, it's been a strange, strange time, and I know for all of you as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, yeah, that shared experience at the moment is um, is quite uncanny. Um, so jumping into our second question, I'm curious about your childhood, and I'm wondering whether you would mind sharing a story from your childhood that you feel has informed your hybrid artistic practice today? Uh, there are many stories, but um, I think, I mean, I, I'm incredibly fortunate that I spent part of my childhood in the English countryside. My parents are actually originally from Cape Town. And at some point, my parents decided they wanted to leave London and live in a bigger open space. My, my parents had farmed north of Cape Town in the Cedarburg Mountains. And I'm actually named after the Namaqualand daisy, which is a mm. part of the indigenous flora of the Cape. And I think one of the strangest things that happened to me in my childhood is my father decided it would be a good idea to start a, an organic shiitake mushroom farm following the traditional Japanese tradition of growing shiitake on logs in the woods and, and mushrooms are incredibly fashionable these days but at the time it was a very weird thing to tell my friends at school about because I would spend my weekends 
banging on logs to simulate thunder to to make the mushrooms grow because uh, they as my dad always said mushrooms don't want to be mushrooms um mushrooms are a stress response and so this this idea of them emerging um with thunder and other kinds of uh stresses to suddenly protect themselves um was a very strange way to think about the natural world rather than it being something distant that we look at it was very much a a process of interacting but made me very very strange at school and i think that that kind of dealing with being strange and um but also having this quite intense um sort of interaction which is about controlling nature really informed a lot of what i started to explore i actually trained in architecture i i did my first degree and then Sorry, that's the intern in the background, <laughs> if, if this makes the cut. <laughs> so I, I actually trained in architecture, did my first degree in architecture, and then took this, this strange and winding route to where I am now. And when I think back to those kinds of experiences, it really is clear to me how I ended up essentially investigating human control over the natural world. And now sort of moving more towards trying to turn the lens and looking at how the natural world that we're part of sees us as as we have cast ourselves as somehow separate. Yeah, well, thank you for that um, really beautifully detailed introduction. I mean, it's really interesting to me to kind of hear how, um, yeah, your your sort of early relationship with the natural environment was so embedded in your everyday life, but then also thinking of, yeah, architecture as both material and immaterial structures that sort of sustain us, support us, house us, but also then kind of, I don't know, can potentially restrict us as well in terms of how we see ourselves within an environment. Um, There's nothing like banging on a log to make you feel um, that you are somehow uh, taking control and and causing mm. other organisms stress. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I didn't, I didn't even really know. I knew that mushrooms, yeah, sort of emerged in that way, but I didn't know that it was, um, yeah, I guess, uh, facilitated by human intervention, you know, that of course, yeah, like it's not just kind of a naturally occurring process. I We'd also get the tractor and dump batches of logs into cold water and let them soak. Uh -huh. So there's, there's many strange ways that even on an organic shiitake mushroom farm, you're, you're intervening. You can intervene. Yeah, fascinating. But he no longer does um, that. <laughs> it turns out it's not what, a good business. <laughs> what does he do now? Uh, um, many things. He's a, a garden enthusiast, which I imagine we'll get to as well, um, and spends his time emerged in East Asian landscape. So again, that's another sort of set of influences that have um, taught me. He's a, a, a scholar of of zen and chinese and japanese landscape beautiful um yeah i mean that's really interesting to kind of um yeah understand your work within the context of the place in which you've come from emerged from um yeah i mean i was you know i was definitely delving deep into some of the earlier podcasts that you had recorded and one that particularly struck my interest um, was created not so long ago i guess roughly a year ago in december 2020 um, and it was titled interrogating our better futures produced by biosphere 2 and I mean, you acknowledge this word better in your, you know, artist statement as well, but I was really interested in, um, in this word better and what better really means to you and to who. Um, but I was wondering, yeah, would you mind sort of unpacking how you understand this notion of better for our listeners and why you feel it's potentially a problematic thing? Well, better became an obsession is, is probably the best way to, to give a health warning to this bit. Um, I had strangely immersed myself in the world of synthetic biology. I spent about 10 years hanging out with genetic engineers who were very enthused about creating a better world. And this group of synthetic biologists, it's a field of genetic engineering that emerged around the year 2000. And I learned about it when I was doing my master's at the Royal College of Art. And I was immediately completely fascinated and thrilled because this was a group of engineers and computer scientists coming into biology. 
and they were looking at biology as a software system, essentially software and hardware, and that DNA could be a programmable code to produce things that would be useful for humans. So fuels, medicines, chemicals, and even sort of active biological processes, things that turn on and off and could be used in the body. And I'm not a scientist. And this whole idea of an ideological approach to a science was also really new to me. I, I don't have a back, background in technology or science. So seeing how a group could come into a field and place their ideology on something as enormous as essentially the code that we're all created from was, was completely extraordinary. And I was doing a master's at, at the RCA in a program called Design Interactions, which was a slightly different kind of design practice. It was using design in a more critical way, so more akin to art practice, to explore the implications of emerging technologies. And that's how I ended up sort of learning about synthetic biology. It was around 2008. And as I hung out with synthetic biologists and I hung out with technologists and I hung out with designers and everyone was promising that they had the way to make the world better. And I ended up at the TED conference around 2011 and everyone there wants to make the world a better place. And I had this realization that that was an admirable goal, but what on earth did better mean and, and who was it better for and ultimately who gets to decide? And I went off to, to write my PhD about this problem because I realized that it's a modern incarnation away of the, the problematic myth of progress, this idea that humans could emancipate themselves from the natural world, from the enlightenment onwards, through knowledge and scientific endeavor, that somehow this would uplift all of humanity. And of course, in that is a hugely problematic set of ideas, including the idea of emancipating ourselves from the natural world being an improvement, that other species are not part of that, that only certain groups ultimately actually get emancipated, and that the total disconnect of, of the understanding that our natural world is part of our own survival and creating this disconnect is in a way part of the problems that that certain societies have created for for all of us and all species so i began to look at in synthetic biology in particular how different ideas of what better meant held by different individuals actually determined what got made so different visions mm. resulting in material things for example some groups of synthetic biologists really believe that DNA should be an open source programming code and that anyone could participate and we wouldn't um, patent sort of individual bits of DNA and said it's the construction of new, new actions and behaviours that, that could be owned. Whereas other groups are saying, well, the better world is where we tie ecosystems to the economy, grow sugarcane, feed it to microbes, make fuel and the world in a way continues as it is for, for many of us. Mm -hmm. And in all of these considerations, the ultimate goal is the bettering of humans and not the natural mm -hmm. world. And still this disconnect continues. So a lot of the problem is that better means something different for all of us. And it means something different in each of our everyday decisions. So I believe that a better future is one where we look after all humans, all species, our planet, and yet this morning I went and bought a coffee with a plastic lid because in that moment I really needed a cup of coffee and I didn't have my, my reusable cup with me. So what was better for me in the short term was my own survival in the moment and not my other ideas of what better is and the, the beliefs I hold. And that's a problem is that better means something different for all of us and many parallel betters live together. And if we look at the natural world, there's no really, there's no idea of better. So we as humans are hopeful animals we even if everything is terrible there's this belief because we can imagine that things could be otherwise and perhaps we're unique in our ability to imagine the future and to anticipate so present conditions can be improved so if everything looks terrible it could get better is sort of <laughs> fundamental to the way we're programmed the, to our survival 
Mm. But in the natural world, better doesn't really apply. So, and we are obviously part of that natural world. So if we think of evolution, you know, a giraffe doesn't suddenly think, well, I could get those trees if I grow, if I get a neck extension. <laughs> Instead, better can only really be described as something that is an act of chance, that is an adaptation to context and that affects mm. an entire species, not individuals. So... Mm. You know, the, the fact that a new feature emerges that is actually an improvement is an act of, of chance and depends on the context. Mm. If that context changes, it's no longer better. So mm. it's a really fascinating, for me, way of thinking about what humans do, what we make and why we behave as we do. And, mm. you know, when we start to think about the things that we invest in, for example, synthetic biology or artificial intelligence, new kinds of life forms, there's this obsession with innovation, with the new as being better and a lack of interest um, in the old or maintaining or preserving um, in general. And of course, I'm massively generalizing when I say we humans, because I'm really talking about the ideologies that have informed Western societies and, and modern, like in terms of modern with a capital M, the modern world. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, yeah, it is um, such a complex range of ideas and theories when you start to unpack it and I mean when you were just talking about better and its relation to newness and innovation it's interesting because um when thinking back you know to Rivers and I guess the context in which this Biennale is sort of emerging from one thing that I'm really admiring about the way that Jose Roca is collaborating with the curatorium and the creation of this exhibition is that the sort of foundational principle is building upon what's already there and I think in a Biennale context, that is quite radical. I mean, there's this real um, push towards, yeah, this thing that's never been seen before, the latest work of that artist commissioning these really big, new, grand things, um, whereas I think this approach has really, um, I guess, nourished pre-existing relationships that curators hold with artists, but also this kind of deep investment and labour into, like, long-standing research projects and ideas um, and so, yeah, I guess it's a different sort of lens to look at it through, but I think that it's, um, yeah, it's still interesting to kind of think of our obsession with this idea of, of new in relation to this idea of better. But I also too, um, you know, really like when you were kind of talking about, um, yeah, essentially the decision makers, you know, who are these people that are determining what better is and for who. And in that way, I often think about that even relation to whose story is being told, you know, like who has that power to be kind of like deciding essentially what, um, what is shared and why and what's endorsed and what's financially supported. Well, that's what I found so fascinating with my little lens into the world of, of synthetic biology was watching a new technology, a new field being constructed and the political machinations that were necessary to make that happen. Mm. And my thesis was really looking at that process of world building, how mm. individual visionaries coalesce other people around them, become powerful, build institutions to materialize their vision as, you know, how mm. humans behave. Um, and it's always useful. I think Margaret Atwood puts it very beautifully to paraphrase her from The Handmaid's Tale is, you know, better for some is always worse for others. And this, I mean, that's the fundamental problem with the utopia as well as the, you know, when we're lying on our sun lounger waiting for someone to serve us our cocktail in our utopia, um, obviously someone is serving us. And that's, there's mm. a fundamental flaw in the idea, which is why it will never exist. And dystopia mm. also, you know, is someone else's utopia. And mm. the, where I ended up looking was at the idea of the heterotopia, which comes from um, an idea from Foucault. And he describes this as worlds that aren't better or worse, but different. They're places where we can mm. reflect on ourselves. And he describes mm. cemeteries, cruise ships, uh, all these sort of other kinds of places that are, are strange um, sort of places that we reflect back on our world you know the idea of being locked on mm. a cruise ship is, is a this parallel world we live in and those mm. are not just places to go to but they're places to look back on, on how we behave and act and I find that a much mm. more useful way to think about um how we you know how we behave and a lot of the work I've been doing that in the last three or four years is 
in a way, world building, these heterotopias as other spaces to look back and analyze how we've ended up with this word that doesn't mean anything. And we're pinning, you know, build back better, all these sort of mantras that have been coming out, to, especially post COVID um, or during COVID, I should say, um, that's in a word are, are meaningless because they're tied to, there's no set of values behind better. There's, it's not even progress as problematic it is, has a, a, a slogan of, of uplifting. Um, but better is just the point between two places that are under uh, are not determined, mm. and of course mm. they're then being determined by a set of individuals and placed on mm. other people's lives. And uh, you know, as we speak now, COP is underway, and when we look back at this from the future, we'll be you know reflecting on on what was decided there for all of <laughs> humanity, all of the species of the world, and all future generations um, of mm. organisms. So what will be better when we look back? Yeah, I mean, this is a slight segue, but I think I also listened to this perhaps in this podcast that I referenced just a moment ago, um, that you, I think you make like a, a distinction between like better as being this kind of um, reversal in a way, like this kind of um, romanticism or nostalgia associated with rewilding. And as you mentioned earlier, like mushrooms being really trendy now and, um, you know, that being seen as being better, like, you know, moving into the past or the ways we used to do things. And then that kind of sits, um, you know, against this idea of better as being this thing that is kind of propelling us forward, um, aided by technology. I think it's, um, so this, this idea of the social imaginary is, you know, this idea of the better future, a social imaginary is something, you know, money is a social imaginary. If I give you, you know, a dollar bill, it's a piece of paper or plastic now, but it's a symbol of something that we've agreed to believe in. And the idea of the nation is a is a social imaginary. It's a thing that we've all agreed to believe in, but is just a line drawn on a map or a fence put along a, a border that's being created. And in the same way, the better future is a kind of imaginary that we all sort of invest in or certain people invest in. But the golden age is also, you know, the fictitious past that was somehow better is also a kind of social imaginary. So better doesn't have to be in the future. It can be the past, but it can still guide us in the future. So, mm. you know, from recent years, the Make America Great Again movement is a social imaginary of, of a, a golden age that didn't necessarily exist. Mm-hmm. But it guides where we are. And so in conservation practice and these sort of debates about rewilding or preservation are really um, kind of led in a way by that because the more I've learned, the, the, you know, the, the, the thing about evolution is that biology moves on. So if you reconstruct a lost landscape, it's not the same. You know, things have changed, mm. the climate's changed, the environment has changed, the organisms themselves have changed, which is why mm. rewilding can be really interesting because it's as a conservation strategy, and, and I'm not promoting it as a, a good or bad way, but the idea that you don't necessarily need the same organisms, it's about preserving functionality. So I don't have organism X, but I can put organism Y in because it performs the same mm. functions of dispersing seeds or building dams or, or, you know, eating stuff that needs to be eaten. Um, and in a way, so it's not so much rebuilding an exact replica of the past, but it's it's preserving functionality. And so it's a, mm-hmm. an interesting way of thinking about what does it mean to be an ecosystem and, and mm-hmm. how should we see their functionality? Is it about the, the bigger picture in a way? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because, as you said, it's sort of um, in, like it's, it's that whole process of intervening, I guess, and, and yeah, how you sort of then, um, yeah, work with what's there and I guess what the purpose or how you see these kind of environments existing, coexisting. To go back to that idea of what's better in nature, I mean, you could argue that it doesn't, none of it really matters. <laughs> if we destroy the planet things will adapt to context that we destroy our natural mm. ecosystems. Like it's our set of evaluations that's saying it's worse. There will be mm. organisms mm. that survive. It will be hotter, drier, wetter, um, more toxic, but life most likely will continue. 
but is it the mm. life that we want? And that's where better becomes. It's this value set that we get to decide. And mm. that's why for me, it's such a powerful way to think about it because it's a word that we coalesce around, but don't think about what we actually mean by it. We will assume that it mm. means that we're all talking about the same thing, but are we talking about mm. that disposable cup of coffee coming when I need it? Or are we saying, well, future generations of all people, all species need to be um, able to have the right to enjoy a comfortable lifestyle given their present evolutionary <laughs> state. Um, mm. So it's a really messy word, but that's why it's, it looks so neat and tiny and so promising. And then you start to open it up and it, it just is a, a morass festering under me. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I feel like there are so many words like that. I mean, I think I feel that way about words such as collaboration and collectivity and community. <laughs> I feel like they're just like words that are used so liberally. Um, but then when you actually kind of start to think about what you mean by those words, it's really difficult to sort of ground them you know or to have a strong position on on what they look like in practice um coming back to this idea I guess you know the, I guess the context or the the framing of this podcast is being with AI um and I'm curious to kind of I guess under, or talk more directly to this idea of better and its entanglement maybe with AI technologies technologies more specifically um yeah I mean would you like to kind of talk to that Having spent a lot of time with synthetic biology, I mm. realized that synthetic biology was increasingly being entwined with artificial intelligence and machine learning and different t types of computation. And in a way, the goal is common. It's about creating life or lifelikeness as a way to help humans for our own utility. And the other, for me, one of the most disturbing things about about our investment in AI is this question of who is it, who is it bettering the world for and uh, why do we invest so much in it? And I was particularly, I've become particularly concerned when you just look at this balance between existing life forms and how much we care for them and our obsession with this new kind of life that we're hoping to create. So why is there this huge <laughs> rift between what we spend? I, mean, I was at a, a synthetic biology conference and the conservationist Kent Redford, who's a, a, a wonderful individual who's been working with the synthetic biology community to look at the relationship between conservation and synthetic biology. And he put up a slide showing how much is spent on ice cream in the US per annum and how much is spent on biodiversity conservation and in a way if you ate less you know if, if we ate less ice cream we could have more forests or more rhinos or you know it's just this kind of crazy way of looking at um where we what we value and again we I mean you know the societal um norms in in technologically driven societies I guess we're talking about AI in a sense of, as you said, it's kind of um, our deep investment in these kind of new technical imaginary futures and how that sort of sits in opposition to the ways in which we are conserving and caring for our natural environment that's around us. Do you sort of, I don't know, see there being, I don't know, any kind of positives or like, you know, um, anything that's kind of nourishing about these more than human relationships with AI technologies, or do you see it as being largely detrimental to the relationships that we hold with the natural world? I think as with any technology, it's, you can't separate who's making it and why they're making it. And these technologies are, are made by humans. Um, so it's, you can't, sort of broad brush everything, but you can look at what most of these are being used for, you know, is a, an algorithm that helps us do our shopping or buy plane tickets more efficiently um, or make more money for an airline or, you know, sort of get the buses to run on time. Like everything in our lives is, is now being run by some kind of, you know, process, <laughs> computational process to optimize and improve it. And there's another word is, is optimization, which is linked to better. Because um, what, is, what is the optimal? 
Um, and it's this set of values that drives technology and these values are created by humans. Mm. One of the debates in synthetic biology is could it be used to help conservation and, and especially I think for, for the audiences coming to Sydney will be this question of the coral reef and could coral be engineered to actually withstand warmer waters and what does it mean to release engineered organisms into the wild or whatever the wild means to support natural species and you know these are all artificial definitions created by us to to organize our thoughts the wild natural wilderness um what does it mean though you know if if the coral is engineered is it still wild coral um mm. how can we even think about controlling that technology will we ever be able to control it and, and the answer is probably no because the processes underlying it are under their own you know random evolutionary process and ultimately we don't have control and, and these are some of the questions that we can apply to AI and, and computational life forms as well and, and that's part of the the fear around them is is you know will we will, will the singularity happen and we all you know the AI decide that we're the problem um and ultimately it's up to humans to 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 work with those things but and make the decisions about what we allow and what we don't allow and but that's where we you know, where i become nervous is you know who's making these decisions and who do they who do those decisions impact and um i'm particularly interested though in thinking about the application of these technologies to the natural world as a way to reflect on why we make these technologies. And that's what I've been doing in, in the, my latest work, Pollinator Pathmaker. How does this project selected for exhibition speak to and also question the realities of being with AI in the contemporary world? Well, the substitute, which will be, um, he, will, he or they will be visiting Sydney, is really a solidification of some of these ideas for me. Um, so I was, the piece sort of came about in 2018 when I read on Twitter in the recommended for me newsfeed that Sudan, the last male northern white rhino, had died. And this really affected me for two reasons. One was, well, I didn't know there was only one male left and what does that mean? And I'd never even thought about, you know, you're just like rhinos are endangered, but suddenly there's only two females left and like, how could this happen? And the second thing was how strange that it's Twitter telling me this, you know, some algorithm has decided that I need to know this and, you know, by tomorrow that story will have disappeared. Um, it's a trending news story. And when I looked in the, the newspapers and clicked through a lot of these stories were followed up by, well, it's okay because there's efforts to de-extinct these, these animals, you know, sperm and cells from their skin and um, have been collected and preserved. And there's two different projects. And one is in Germany to try and, through IVF, um, extract eggs from the last two females, which in itself is an incredibly dangerous endeavor for those two individuals and then create an embryo and insert it into a southern white rhino as related subspecies and then there's another effort to actually grow a rhino from stem cells at, um, that's coming from the University of California San Diego frozen zoo project and so it was the fact that both of these stories like don't worry we've ruined it <laughs> but technology will solve it really struck me and I was appearing on a panel at London Science Museum the, the following week that was called Artificial Life, uh, something like could we, should we, will we or something along those lines and I, I had a sort of mini breakdown on stage just thinking that this is absolutely nuts. We were talking about whether you know, consciousness will be achieved through AI and how will we control it and I think well we can't even control ourselves to preserve something as extraordinary and intelligent and sentient and you know deserving of existence as a northern white rhino um so how can we even be having this conversation and then a couple of weeks later i was sent by a friend a, a piece of research that had come out of DeepMind, the artificial intelligence company 
that's part of Google. And the researcher, Andrea Bonino, and his team had been working with an artificial agent. So we could think of it as like a dot, but it's a a piece of AI, um, exploring how it learns to navigate around an artificial space. And what they discovered as they set this in motion was that the AI learned to map a space and make sense of where it was um, in a way, it solved the problem in the way that the mammalian brain has solved it with this concept called grid cells. So when we look at a space in our brains, there's a set of cells firing in a grid that help us make sense and map a space. And the artificial agent decided to solve this problem of space or evolved a solution that followed the same idea. Mm. And these little bits sort of fed together and the Cooper Hewitt commissioned me to make this piece called The Substitute, which was looking at some of these ideas of the a copy of life. And Mm. in the case of the northern white rhino, if a northern white rhino is born to a southern white rhino and there's no other northern white rhinos for it to learn how to be a northern white rhino from, is it really a northern white rhino? Is it just, it's an imperfect copy in a way because the social behaviors are lost. Mm. And it's only mm. what's encoded in the DNA that, that mm. remains. So if you mm. think about a bird it, that learns to sing, if it's isolated from other birds and never hears another bird song, its bird song is mm. very basic and there's experiments being done on this. In the same way, a northern white rhino is the most social of all the rhino subspecies um, and has a very extensive range of vocalizations. So all of this kind of connected back to me to Dürer's rhinoceros. And if you've ever seen that print from 1515, mm-hmm. it's that mm-hmm. famous mm-hmm. engraving that's really sort of an, icon, an icon of the enlightenment of this rhino. And he's got a second horn on his back, and he's a, mm. a bad copy of a rhino. And Dürer never saw that rhino. That rhino had actually been sent from India to the king of Portugal, who thought it was so great that he shipped it onto the Pope as a gift. And it died in a shipwreck on the way. And Dürer heard reports of this rhino and drew a picture of it. And this copy, this copy with an error in it, was passed around and became reprinted in many different ways. And I've been looking in archives at the Natural History Museum in London at all the different versions of this from the 16th and 17th century where this mistake carried through. So this idea of life being copied, but not being quite the right thing that that sort of informed the substitute. And so when you go into the gallery, what you see is a five meter wide window and it's a projection, but it's a space on the other side of the wall that you're, you're looking into an artificial space. And you start to see this sort of lump of little little blocks moving around the space becoming increasingly rhino-like and it's pacing around and the resolution increases and increases until there's a life-size projection of a northern white rhino looking you in the eye he's grunting snorting squeaking these are all real noises taken from soundtracks of northern white rhinos in um, recorded in the 2000s in the zoo in the Czech Republic where the last eight northern white rhinos were held at that time and this copy of the rhino looks you in the eye and then he disappears and then the process starts again and he's actually walking around the space following the paths of the artificial agent from the deep mind experiment so he's in a way performing this the the path of this artificial agent learning to navigate So it's a set of different interconnected ideas, but what the experience is for you when you look at this thing is this extraordinary animal coming to life, looking in the eye, and then he goes. He is the copy for our time. He's the substitute, or they are the substitute. He's neither male nor female. He's an amalgamation of lots of different bits of information about what a northern white rhino is, but he's not the real thing. Yeah, it's such a beautiful detailed description of that work. And also, I mean, yeah, as you said, I think it really, you know, beautifully ties together some of the ideas that we've been exploring today. Um, you know, when you're sort of thinking through and questioning when you, yeah, when you intervene in such a way, then what are you left with? Like, yes, in the same way that you were talking about, if we were to, um, yeah, genetically create coral and implant it into an ecosystem and then sort of have this, 
yeah, this other material situated within a wild environment, what does that then say and mean and how does it then kind of integrate into that environment? But equally when you have this kind of, yeah, DNA that has been embedded into another species, but then it doesn't have the sociability of being with its its own, um, yeah, its own people. See, I, I call him he because affectionately I think of him as a he but he's not a he. Um, one of the jokes has been that because I work with an amazing um, visual effects company in London called The Mill to, to make him. Mm. And I mean, maybe this is behind the curtain telling a little bit too much, but he has no testicles because <laughs> we ran out of money to, to model the <laughs> testicles. Um, I suddenly realised that he, he didn't have any. And one of the reasons <laughs> is that he and himself is a copy and an imperfect copy and mm. the model of the rhino that we used, he's a fully animated, incredible rendering, um, you know, a mobile 3D puppet, essentially, that has with huge mm. detail, um, you know, muscles that move, you know, incredibly complex Hollywood style reproduction. Mm. And he was actually a southern white rhino before and he was in a Brazilian energy drink oh. commercial. <laughs> <laughs> and we adapted this model to make him into a northern white rhino for for the piece and I loved that idea that he in himself had been shipped around he came from the LA office of the mill digitally mm. to London thinking about Jura's rhinoceros traveling and these pieces of paper and copies Sudan sperm being shipped from Kenya to San Diego this whole thing is a story of modern communication strategies digital physical and what you end up is is just not the thing. It's not yeah. the rhino in the wild being social. And you know, even Sudan was was captured in Africa, sent to the Czech Republic, sent back to Kenya. These poor animals who travelled around the world um, mm. for our entertainment and our curiosity and our efforts to preserve. But we end mm. up with nothing. And in the substitute, what you're looking at are two. For me, there's two important things. One is he ends up looking at you and you. <laughs> the idea was to really create this emotional response. What you see at first is strange and weird and noisy. And then he just looks you in the eye and then disappears. And there's this moment where you are the, you're the subject of the artwork. You're being stared at. And at the same time, there's also this reference to Jura's rhinoceros. He's in a white box. He's alone. He's, mm. he's not a rhino, he's a specimen, he's a thing. He's not a set mm. of interactions with other organisms. The sounds that he's emitting taken from these videotapes from Dr. Richard Pollock, who, who recorded this sound in the Czech Republic, are social interactions between rhinos. And what we've done is just mm. taken them, extracted them, put them on him. And that's, you mm. know, that's a rhino. <laughs> but it's not a rhino. Yeah. A rhino is a yeah. thing, a being that lives in an environment that eats other organisms that become part of an ecosystem and a rhino in a way is not a rhino it's a set of interactions and that's a way to look at everything in the natural world mm. it's you know context is everything yeah I mean I have done some reading on this work but yeah I mean you've just opened up a whole new way of sort of perceiving and understanding because I didn't know of this kind of relationship with um Jura's rhinoceros which I'm very familiar with a thing that I in all of these pieces that I've been making is actually to try and create something incredibly simple so mm. for anyone listening who's terrified by, you know, the idea of having to understand all of this, the very basic interaction that I want people to have with this is to just to see a rhinoceros because we mm. read about them. You know, I read about this rhino on Twitter, had a momentary connection and then it could have been gone. But I happened to pursue it and make an artwork from it over a year or two. And so he lives he lives in my server in the studio and he lives in in museums and other spaces and in in 2021 he lived in a park in Athens for a bit <laughs> and as part of an exhibition and it's a uh, it's the only rhino it's the only northern white rhino I'm ever mm. gonna see I think what you've kind of unearthed here is that like this idea you mentioned it before context but it's like yeah that when you sort of remove remove anything from its natural habitat for want of a better word then you are sort of yeah again coming back to this idea of um yeah intervening in this kind of natural process and then what does that then mean for that species and yeah I don't know I mean when just thinking about um 
our coexistence and codependence with the natural world. I think it's just, it's really fascinating for me to kind of, yeah, think through this work as that relate, that rhino being dislocated from the place in which, you know, he is, he is meant to be essentially. And we're kind of, yeah, looking at him emerge and grow and shift and change based on this code that then sort of dissipates in a second. So I've been in conversation over the, over the last couple of years with Oliver Ryder from the UCSD Frozen Zoo, who's working with the stem cells and understanding more mm. about that process of how they've created these um, cells that, you know, can live on from mm. separate to rhinoceros, but are, are they mm. rhinoceros? And sort of on Zoom, mm. he's showing me video of these beating myocardial stem cells. So the, mm. you know, the they've been able to diff- make the cells become heart cells and they're beating wow. and pulsing mm. and it's you know if I zoomed out would I get a rhino no because we don't know what to do with, you know there's not yet the technology yeah. or the knowledge to know how to turn these things into a rhino but mm. is it a rhino well no it's a copy of one particular rhino and mm. each of us is an individual product of an evolutionary process we're different um and we're not static you know we, ch- we change mm. but so creating this copy and that's something that comes up in my my practice my fascination with the the natural history museum as a product of western science and this idea of capturing the individual object putting the natural specimen on view holding it as an object um mm. rather than thinking of it in this much more complex and um you know, real way, which is that, you know, one thing eats another um, and poops it out and then that helps another thing grow. And that's the, mm. you know, that's actually the reality of life. Yeah, I'm curious in relation to your work currently, the Pollinator Commission, like how this kind of, yeah, your research within the substitute has kind of now filtered into a, a more expansive project work. And, um, in the substitute, you become, in a way, the subject of the work as he looks at you. The the tables are turned and the Pollinator Commission for the Eden Project, um, which is a work that's that's just launched in November 2021 and is a continuing and growing piece called Pollinator Pathmaker, is in a way trying to turn that lens in a slightly different way. So with the rhinos looking at us, I want to investigate more what he's seeing. And so Pollinator Pathmaker is the my new effort to try and think about that. So the Eden Project is in Cornwall in the UK and is an ecological attraction. It's a bit like a botanical garden, but it's it's different. It's a place where you that invites um sort of exploration of the natural world, creating a sense of connection and awe and and an understanding of the jeopardy it faces, but also instilling in the visitor a sense of hope and agency that we can do something. So it's quite different to a botanical garden, which if you think about it, it's really a collection of stuff that has been collected from around the world as part of colonial expeditions mm. and you know, creating uh, a curation of the natural world. So Eden has a slightly different ethos, which really inspired me. And I was asked to create a piece about pollinators to bring attention to their jeopardy as part of a a larger program they're doing called Create a Buzz. Um, And the site was 55 metres of prime turf (laughs) in the bowl. This is clay pit in Cornwall with the Eden's famous biomes that filled with rainforests. And and I thought, 55 metres for a five-year commission, this is definitely itching to be living and not a reproduction of nature for once Mm. and so I propose that we make an artwork for pollinators and Mm. as I started to research pollinators so butterflies bees moths wasps ants hoverflies all these things that we we don't really think about as pollinators and pollinators are completely essential Mm. to the functioning of ecosystems because many plants Mm. can only reproduce with the help of these insects and other creatures that move pollen around and help them make seeds, Mm. um, I started to understand that pollinators see us very differently. (laughs) They see the world very differently. They see colour differently. So bees don't have the same 
uh, color receptors that we do. We see RGB, red, green, blue. Mm. They don't see red, but they see, see UV. They see polarized light, which we obviously can't see. So that's how they mm. navigate. They see depth differently. So things close up uh, and focus, things you know, 10 centimeters away. Mm. It's blurry or what we would understand as blurry. But as they fly past stuff, they can see individual flowers, whereas we just see a blur. Butterflies see color differently. They have different receptors. Different butterflies see color differently. It's incredibly complex. So what does a garden look like to them? And that was really the starting point. Um, and also learning about how they travel. So, for example, mm. bees and, and some other species are extraordinary because they memorize the locations of the flowers they visit. And a bee mm. will visit, say, 10,000 flowers in a day. So knowing where those flowers are and where they're going to go the next day to forage is incredibly important because the journey time between each needs to be optimized to save calories. So think of the traveling salesman, you know, going door to door. <laughs> he needs to not be zigzagging across town. She needs to not be zigzagging across town, um, but find the most efficient route. And that's actually a mathematical problem called the traveling salesman problem that bees are able to solve. It's making these efficient trap lines. So all of this kind of came together and the idea was, well, rather than using a technology to bring attention to that technology and the paradox that it brings towards the natural mm. world, is it possible to use a technology in the, in the other way and actually use it as a buffer from our own sets of values and use it in service of other organisms? So Pollinator Pathmaker is an algorithm that makes the most empathetic garden for pollinators. So a garden, mm. you could say, well, if pollinators design gardens, what would we see? And the algorithm tries to do that. So mm. we've built a database working with Eden's horticulturalists and pollinator scientists and experts, um, a database of about 150 plants for the UK and Northern Europe. And this is the first step of the project. And that database, we know each plant, its pollinators, when it comes into bloom and, and other bits of information mm. about it. The algorithm, the problem it's trying to solve is empathy. And I defined empathy as supporting the maximum number of pollinator species possible. So it chooses mm. plants, once you've told it your garden conditions, it chooses the mm. plants and arranges them to solve that problem. So what mm. you end up with is a garden that a human would not design, a kind of completely mad jumble of different <laughs> colours because different pollinators attract different colours, um, different mm. sizes because different pollinators like different size flowers and different shaped flowers because they have different shaped mouth parts and all mm. the stuff that is not catering to human taste but catering to pollinators' mm. tastes instead. Mm. And... The idea is that it's not just this garden at Eden. There's a website, pollinator.art, where you can go and create your own artwork. And what I want to do is use this kind of technology, this platform of a digital artwork, to actually create physical artworks for pollinators around the world. So it's an art-led mm. campaign. We're working with um, Google Arts and Culture and the Gaia Art Foundation and Garfield Weston Foundation to get this going. So mm. what this means is you go on pollinator.art, put in your garden conditions, um, you can play with the algorithm a bit to, to play with how to solve it, and a garden grows in front of you. And then you can download your planting instructions and plant your own DIY edition of the artwork. So it's a sort of anti-NFT <laughs> process because you get this for free, you can plant it for free. And obviously at the moment it's not catering to people in Sydney, um, but the idea is actually creating a different kind of commissioning model as part of this project, saying, mm. how can we be more empathetic in the way we make art? Who is it for if it's um, mm. and who has access to it? So this is art mm. for pollinators enabled by humans. But what um, how do we grow that? How can we actually create agency to help other species? Mm. And so each time mm. a new international garden is commissioned, we work with local experts to create a new pollinator plant palette that's added back mm. to the website. So then local audiences can grow and can play with it and um, with locally appropriate plants and then hopefully plant their own. So in a way, it goes back to the mushroom idea. It's these sort of networks sprouting everywhere. Um, and it's just, for me, is a different way of thinking about what a digital artwork can do. It results, it's just a, a vehicle for creating physical stuff 
So the idea is to create the world's largest climate positive artwork through this process. This kind of AI technological advancement is sort of um, dissected from our understanding of yeah, how we engage with the natural world and, and whether that's being exploitative. But in this way, it's about, I mean, I also too obviously love that, um, yeah, like the, the plant species. I mean, of course they are, but they're kind of then designed or selected for a particular place, climate, you know, working with, as you said, Indigenous species. And, and that there's this kind of invitation for this, um, this initial prototype in a way to kind of then encompass the, the globe. Well, I've, I've just planted my DIY garden <laughs> and we're doing <laughs> another one next year in the Serpent for the Serpentine Galleries in London, so mm. in Hyde Park. And then we're doing our first international commission with Light Art Space in Berlin. So we'll be creating mm. a new plant list for, for warmer European climate. Um, but it's, I mean, really basic things that I had never twigged was why do flowers bloom at different times of the year? Well, it's because the pollinators that they've co-evolved with emerge at different times of the year. So to mm. create a garden that blooms across the year is um, one that serves lots of different pollinators. I mean, I just never, I'm, you know, it's like so obvious when you think about it. Um, yeah. And that's what the algorithm or, you know, we could generously call it AI here is doing mm. is it's solving mm. it's optimizing a problem that is too complex mm. for the average mm. person to solve it and it's it's not just choosing the plants it's actually arranging them that, in ways that suit mm. different foraging styles so trap lines are catered for so in a way what we're doing is visualizing we can never it's an anthropomorphic um, mm. exploration of what do pollinators want and what the result is just something that's beneficial. It's super dense planting. It caters mm. to many different species. We know that long-tongued bumblebees and social wasps. So the idea is that there's actually, we're catering to more than just pollinators. It's actually helping us create ecosystems. And if this all sounds very complex, the, the main point, <laughs> I guess, again, like with the rhino just looking at you, is when I planted my DIY garden a few weeks ago, my addition, my unique addition, I had to go buy these plants and seeds and I put them in the ground and I really felt that it wasn't for me. I didn't get to choose how it looked. I didn't get to mm. choose which plants. I was told what to do and I became the caretaker and my job was to get mm. this in the ground. I was paying for it and, <laughs> you know, back hurt a day of digging and it's my job to look after it. And it really mm. helped me get this sense of perspective. I was so happy when I did it because I realised that for me, the process worked. It was, I suddenly realized mm. that this was not a garden for me to enjoy. I have no idea what it's going to look like. Um, mm. Cause I did it before the visualization tool <laughs> was working on the yeah. website. You can see a beautiful visualization of a scheme that you make before you plant it, decide if you like it. Um, but I really did it in the orthodox way. Whereas I didn't mm. know what it would look like. And um, it's not for me. My job is just to look mm. after it for other species. <laughs> It's such a, yeah, I mean, I say it's a generous gift, but I mean, it's probably more aligned with how we should be thinking about our relationship with those things around us. And it's, um, yeah, I mean, I love that you've, you know, shared this project with us because hopefully this is a, an exciting plug to have, um, you know, Australian investment. Yeah, exactly. So that we can all participate. Well, I think that's also what, for me, thinking about what is an artwork for in the ecological crisis and, and how, as an artist, you know, I work in, I'm incredibly privileged. I work in such a privileged environment. Um, what, what is it, what, what is the role of art mm. in asking these questions and answering them? Pollinator Pathmaker is mm. not a solution to e any ecological crisis. It's a small gesture each time we plant a mm. garden. But the process of doing it is, is, for me, that same moment is when the rhino looks you in the eye. Are you transformed in that process? And mm. of course, many of us don't have gardens. I'm very lucky I have a space that I could put this in. Um, but the idea is to find other ways to do it. So is the value of an artwork a mechanism, a mechanism that we can encourage this in community spaces and schools? And actually, mm. we don't have a plan how to make that work at the moment. What does funding look like for those organisations? But what mm. we're building is a platform to have those conversations. And can an yeah. artwork, can an art-led campaign be a vehicle to get people excited to think about this mm. and have that moment of transformation? 
So very different to an NFT. <laughs> it's not a thing that you look at. It's a thing that you invest in and spend years looking after. Mm. Yeah, but I also think that kind of comes back to the coffee cup, you know, story from the very beginning as well, when it's like you surround yourself, um, you know, like you you embed your value system and it's sort of a reminder as well in terms of, I think, how to be in the world. I mean, <clears throat> I often, you know, think of that even in relation to yoga, like I practice yoga daily, but it's like those practices don't just sort of begin and end with that time spent in that space, you know, like, and equally, yeah, as you said, I mean, you're caring for this, this thing that you plan and that you nourish and you nurture and hopefully it's there as a reminder for like, I don't know, facilitating more, um, ecologically sound habits, you know, and, and ways of kind of coexisting with the natural world, given all these different um, concepts that are sort of floating at the moment. What do you hope that maybe these encounters, um, you know, will leave them with or what they'll take away from these engagements with, yeah, with you, your work, your research? I think it's, I mean, the substitute is a melancholic work. I mean, I think... What I love watching is kids interacting with it and they kind of run up to the rhino and that's a really positive and beautiful thing because it's it's much more engaging than the stuff rhino in the museum in the natural history collection. It, it's a living, breathing thing. So it's that feeling of, of life force that I actually want to communicate. And in a way, the question to ask yourself as you engage with this thing is, is how do I move from loss what, what do I do next? You know, we, we all have a role as consumers, as citizens, as activists, as, as people who think that we can't do anything. And, and in many ways, the only way we can do things is encourage our governments who represent us to do things. It, it's, you know, recycling my coffee cup is a small act, but it, it's not the big act. But it's feeling empowerment and feeling hope, um, even as we lose hope. And I think that's what mm. I, I hope that moment of transformation is not just one of sadness, but one of mm. feeling that it's that there's there's hopefulness in a way. It's easier with pollinator path maker when your hands are in the mm. soil and you're dangling an earthworm <laughs> that, you, that you're saving from the, the little um, from your trowel. But with all of these pieces I'm making is is trying to just change the way we're looking at it to isolate your senses, your aesthetic response, your emotional response, mm. and feel that there's something that can that you can do, even if it's just your attitude. Mm. Thank you so much, Daisy. It's um it's been such a pleasure to spend time with you and to learn more about your research and your practice. It's um yeah, I mean I've got it's really sort of exploded my mind, but I think that there are some, yeah, really beautiful um and really, like you said, really simple key takeaways from from your messaging today, despite the fact that we're dealing with some pretty big uh, concepts that I'm sure are, you know, incredibly new for many of us. But I thank you for your um, your generosity and your, yeah, your willingness to kind of really distill and and sort of simplify the essence of um, your work and kind of what drives you and motivates you. It's it's been yeah such a such a beautiful process, and it's been so lovely to listen to you. Uh, my pleasure. And I'm so excited that the substitute will be traveling to a new continent um, to stare at you all. <laughs> <laughs> we can't wait to meet he or them <laughs> or she, <laughs> all of the above. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you for listening to Being With, a Biennale of Sydney podcast. To learn more about the 23rd Biennale of Sydney, Rivas, head to biennaleofsydney.art.